It looks like most folks are in now. So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Billy Noseworthy. I am a Southeast Asian materials specialist with Olin Library, and I am also working uh, with Cornell University's International Studies program, including the Southeast Asia program, doing a bit of outreach in upstate New York, talking to various faculty across the state, working on a number of projects. Um, this workshop that we are here today to join is called uh, Thinking, or Thinking Historically and Teaching Globally. So uh, just to give you a little bit of background on the workshop before we get started, uh, I've been very excited over the course of the past couple of months to speak uh, in one-on-one -on -one situations to faculty in all different levels across upstate New York. And one of the things that I've learned is that there are major curricular changes um, in some places and sort of minor curricular changes taking place in other places around the theme of incorporating ideas about diversity, equity, and inclusion and social justice into uh, especially the history curriculum, but also across social sciences and humanities curriculums more broadly, because this is going to be a, a new requirement that the SUNY system is putting in. Uh, additionally, um, I particularly enjoyed hearing the perspectives from different faculty about this and learning uh, how they might change their own courses over the course of the next several months or, or coming terms in order to address these themes. Um, one of the major concerns that I heard, especially from humanities faculty, was that some of the changes involved uh, removing a global awareness category as a mandated category, and then putting in place this diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice as a new category, which is not to say that the two are not related, in any way, but just um, that they thought that that might impact what they were able to offer to their students, uh, and, and especially from the perspective of humanities courses. So as I was talking to faculty, it became clear um, that one of the areas where folks at Cornell University and also our networks more broadly were particularly well positioned uh, to help out was to offer some resources uh, for faculty. So I started talking to friends in various libraries and also um, in various departments across the state. And I'm very excited today to be joined by Emily Zinger and Joshua Kwai and Mitch Asso, who are going to be speaking to us about various resources for teaching uh, from this perspective of teaching, uh, thinking historically and also teaching globally. Um, especially as I am trained as a historian, I highly value historical thinking as a methodological approach, but I also think that that historical thinking is something that students pick up from history classes and then are able to apply to a bunch of other disciplines in the social sciences. Um, so without further ado, uh, we'll just get started here. Uh, I will ask the speakers to introduce themselves um, they'll each share some resources for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions during the end of the program here, and we'll wrap up by about 3.30. Um, during the course of the program, if you have questions and you just want to pop them in the chat or to a direct uh, message to me, please feel free to do so. Okay, so Emily Singer, could you please get us started? Absolutely. All right. Okay, is everyone seeing my screen and not my notes? And everyone can hear me? Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emily Zinger, and I'm the Southeast Asia Digital Librarian at Cornell University. In my talk today will start by reviewing some specific digital resources. I know your group requested materials on a few topics, so I'll run through a short list of collections on each of those subjects. But the landscape of digital collections is a really wide one. And I find that even more useful than me just throwing websites at you is for me to talk a little bit about how you can find 
these resources on your own. So for the second half, we'll discuss some searching tips and tricks, as well as what metadata means and how you can use that to your advantage in your research. So we can start with Vietnam. I heard that you're looking for resources that would connect the history of Vietnam with that of the United States, the obvious touch point there being the Vietnam War. So I've brought together here some of the prominent online archival resources related to the Vietnam War, but please recognize that this list is incomplete, especially when considering the entire corpus of Vietnam-related digital archives beyond this one point in history. My list is also biased in that I focused on materials that would be accessible to students without Vietnamese language skills. So I focused a lot on photographs and documents in English. And this does ensure that your students can actually interpret the materials that you provide them with, but it does limit the kinds of viewpoints you can share with primary sources. So keep that in mind throughout this talk. And then also whenever you're selecting archival material to share with your students in general. And we'll be sharing a handout with these links um, after the presentation as well. Okay, so the first resource I have here is the Wall of Faces. It's very interesting in that it's part archive, part social media site. And the goal of this website is to share a photograph for every name that is inscribed on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Uh, the Vietnam Veterans Archive at Brown is a collection of oral histories, documents, photographs, memorabilia, letters from veterans and their family members. The Vietnam Virtual, the Virtual Vietnam, excuse me, Archive out of Texas Tech University is another renowned resource. They currently have over 7 million or approximately 7 million pages of digitized materials. Again, this includes uh, photographs, oral histories, and the bulk of the holdings are more personal rather than official, right? So we're thinking letters home, not institutional records. A quick tip, this archive does contain information on non-digitized material. So make sure you filter your results to digitize for viewing to make sure you can actually access what you're searching for. Now the National Archives is where you can find some of the more official records. This includes Navy deck logs, uh, but also materials related to diplomacy and post-conflict events. And I hope I'm not overlapping with my Library of Congress colleague, but I wanted to point out Chronicling America. This is the Library of Congress's collection of digitized newspapers. It's actually a fantastic resource for teaching American history in general, whatever subject. It covers 1777 to 1963, and its full text search function enables you to pull out specific articles related to your search term. So I just, as an example, threw Vietnam into the search, and, and I got hundreds of results. You don't have to browse through the newspaper. It, it pulls exactly what you're looking for right to the front. Environmental studies was another request. And for me, the first thing that comes to mind there is the Biodiversity Heritage Library. This is the world's largest open access digital library on the subject. And they have a specific collection related to Singapore. Um, I thought that one of the most fascinating items in that collection was this book of annual reports uh, on weather observations. So they give you a they, they tell you the specific longitude and latitude where they're making the observations and then provide these meticulous tables of rainfall and temperature and wind direction. Uh, and I think it's a, a really great entry point for discussing climate change over time. I'll admit this is cheating a little bit. Global Forest Watch is not an archive. It is more of a tool, but it's really, really interesting. It provides near real-time information about where and how forests are changing around the world. So you can use this platform to monitor deforestation, forest fires, land use over time. And I think that the visualization is a really accessible way for students to interpret this kind of information. I also wanna highlight a collection here at Cornell. The Southeast Asia Visions collection includes written and photographed experiences of Europeans and Americans who traveled to Southeast Asia during the period of imperialism. So this collection includes accounts by missionaries, military officers, naturalists. In one case, I think a dog is the purported narrator of, the, of an account. 
Um, and it, it, the items are mostly travel logs and letters, journals, and some photo albums. And they offer these narrative as well as visual descriptions of environment and place unique to this specific time in history. The last discrete topic we'll cover in the first half here is the Philippines. Uh, I think the best place to start is the Philippines Photographs Digital Archive at the University of Michigan. It's a really excellent source. The images mostly depict scenes in and around Manila, like buildings and landscapes, as well as Filipino political and military leaders and members of American commissions and military units. The Welga Digital Archive focuses on preserving and presenting the broad aspects of the Filipino American experience. So here you can find more photographs, but they also have documents and oral histories, as well as ephemera, um, which can be unique to find in a digital archive. And lastly, I'm so sorry, Joshua, again, I'm dipping into the Library of Congress, um, but they have a small collection of videos on the Spanish-American War and it's limited but very dynamic collection that can really help bring this uh, event to life. But as I mentioned, that's just a small selection of digital archival resources you can find on the web. I also want to teach you to find your own sources. So if you've been sitting here thinking, geez, she hasn't talked at all about what I'm actually looking for, you can be empowered to go and seek out these digital collections on your own. So from that brief list, I hope you can see that digital collections are very distributed. They're spread out between the different libraries that have created them, and that can make it very difficult to find all of the existing collections that might prove useful to you. They don't always appear first in Google results. This is often because they're too buried in an institutional website to rise to the top of a Google search. But I do have some tips and tricks to help you with that detective work. Very simple, if you're starting your search in Google, which isn't a bad place to start, just throw some strategic keywords into your search. Phrases like digital archive, digital collection, digital library, these are the words that we librarians use to point to digital primary sources online. And I know that sounds like a really simple um, tip, but it can make a big difference in sorting out digital collections from other related content online. I also suggest looking for subject-specific live guides. So these are research guides that librarians have used to co-locate resources on a single topic, and they often have a section dedicated to digital collections. Um, so, you know, if you're searching Vietnam War Digital Archive, Vietnam War Digital Library, do the same thing, Vietnam War Live Guide, Vietnam War Research Guide. There is no one comprehensive list of digital archives out there, but librarians have started that work in live guides and it can give you a few places to start. It can also really help to use an aggregator such as the Digital Public Library of America. So this site pulls together digital items from hundreds of institutions across the US and it's a really great way to skip that first step of searching the internet at large and instead honing in straight on relevant items. So I'll walk you through a quick example. Here's my DPLA search for Vietnam War. You can see in the main column our different results. And then on the left, the filters that we can use to refine our search, right? Type of material, subject, date, language. But if you scroll down to the bottom of those filters, take a look at contributing institution. This gives you a list of all the different digital archives that have contributed an item related to your search to DPLA and it's broad and often unexpected. So just looking here, you can see university collections like Amherst and Illinois State, but also the Boston Public Library. The Museum of Flight stands out as an interesting contributor. And if you click on those view full item links, you can then view the results in their original digital archive. So I'll admit when I put together my initial resource list for you, I did not think about including the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, but in about three minutes on DPLA, um, we've found their series of war reports on their own website. So this is a very powerful tool uh, if you're looking for primary sources. An important part of successfully using digital archives is understanding how these items are described. 
So each item in a digital archive is accompanied by metadata or data about data. And this includes information, information such as an item's creator, date of creation, associated places, topics, that same information that's in those filters in DPLA. And this is created by librarians to make these items discoverable online. So when you type a word into a digital archive search bar, what you're doing is searching that metadata. You can think of it like a word bank. So if your search term doesn't match the metadata used to describe an item, it will not show up in your results, even if it's relevant to your topic. I think it's easy to understand with an example. So this is an excerpt from a mural painted inside of a Buddhist temple in Laos. And just as a side note, the temple was demolished in the year 2000. So this collection of photographs in the Southeast Asia Digital Library is, as far as I know, the only existing record of this artwork. And on this slide, you can see the metadata record that accompanies that photograph. So we've got the title, uh, the date the photograph was taken, the location of the mural, all of this different con context that can um, describe the item to make it both findable and then understandable once you do find it. So when beginning to use a digital archive, I always find it useful to get a lay of the land, choose one item, any item, and explore its metadata. What fields does the repository use to describe the item? If you're looking for books by a specific publisher, but the digital library only records author names, you're not gonna find what you're looking for. How are languages recorded? Can you search in an original script? Can you search translations? What kinds of subject terms does the archive use and how granular or detailed is that information? Say you're searching for photographs of a specific city, but the archive only lists country names and they don't get more specific than that. If the information is not recorded, then you're not gonna find images of those cities, even if they're in the repository. So if you get this sense of descriptive practices from the get-go, you'll be able to choose better search terms that will match the metadata in the archive. And you'll be able to conduct more successful searches in this matter. It's also important to recognize, however, that metadata, particularly when used to describe non-Western materials, can be biased. So the descriptive standards that librarians use were often created for Western items and subjects, meaning that they don't always appropriately reflect the diversity of subjects present in archival collections from other regions and cultures. And the librarians writing those descriptions don't always have subject knowledge expertise regarding the items they're describing. So we in the field do our best to approach this work with cultural humility and to partner with community members and scholars who do have that cultural knowledge. Uh, but this is just an important thing to keep in mind when conducting um, research beyond Western subjects. My main duty is to serve as project manager for the Southeast Asia Digital Library, so I'd be remiss if I got through this presentation without a quick plug. Um, 15 universities and libraries from around the U.S. have pooled resources and collections to create one digital library of aggregated rare and unique materials about Southeast Asia. So if you're unsure what you're looking for, but you want a place to start, I suggest heading here you'll find over 10,000 digital items, including books from early mission presses, ethnographic photo collections. One of my favorite collections um, is Indonesian local cable television shows. So it's, it's really rich scholarly material. It's also very fun material in my biased opinion. Um, so I recommend checking out this website. And thank you everyone before I pass off to the next speaker. I do want to leave you with this final thought. Uh, working with archival records can be an emotional experience, especially uh, in Southeast Asia studies where you may encounter traces of oppression, trauma, violence, or dehumanizing content. And so it's important to talk to students when you're working with these materials that archives are a very critical way that we understand history. And it's our job to humanize the subjects of these records. And at the same time, it's important to give ourselves space to feel any emotions that might come up in that process uh, when encountering what can sometimes be difficult stories. 
Um, so I just wanna end with that. And my contact information is on this slide. Please reach out if you have any questions. And also please know you're always welcome to come visit Cornell in person. We would love to give you a tour of our physical resources and help you with any teaching or research needs that you may have. Hey, um, thanks, Emily. That was really great. And uh, I'm just going to uh, now share something on the Library of Congress. Um, just give me a second here to set this up. And I hope, can everyone see the PowerPoint? All right, that's great. So, um, well, thank you for the opportunity, uh, first of all, to speak about Asian and other collections at the Library of Congress, um, you know, in relation to world history. Um, so before I do so, I'll just give you a very short introduction to my background and work. Uh, my name is Joshua Quigg, uh, and I'm a Southeast Asia reference librarian at the Asian Division of the uh, Library of Congress. And um, sorry, I work at the uh, Asian Reading Room of the Library and mainly cover insular Southeast Asian topics but I'm also interested in questions to do with world history. So prior to working at the Library of Congress, I studied transregional history at Georgetown University with minor fields in Latin American and environmental history. And uh, for my dissertation, I conducted research on the Chinese community in Manila during the years 1570 to around 1770. And I looked at the role of this community in the Spanish empire. Um, after completing my doctoral studies, I taught courses in Southeast Asia at Georgetown, and then I also taught um, Chinese migration studies at the uh, Catholic University of America. So much of my training and research, and to an extent my teaching experience, has been shaped by a transregional approach. Um, as such, the topic for today's panel, um, thinking historically and teaching globally, is something that's close to my heart. Um, so um, as a reference librarian at the uh, Library of Congress, I have the good fortune of working with colleagues with specialist knowledge in many parts of the world and access to approximately 170 million items in more than 470 languages, uh, which are found in collections throughout the library. And of these collections, I'm uh, most familiar with the Asian collections at the Library of Congress, which are made up of more than 4 million items in various formats. And an increasing number of these items, uh, many of them rare, are being digitized and are now accessible online. Uh, today, I would like to highlight some items from these Asian collections, as well as other resources at the library, and suggest ways they might be used for teaching and studying world history. So I've divided this material up into groups and potential uses. Uh, the first group would be maps, prints, and photographs, and I think these visual representations are particularly good for tracing perceptions of the world, trade routes, and, and empires. The second group would be rare books and manuscripts. The Library of Congress is particularly strong when it comes to examples of religious texts. Um, I think these would be useful for teachings uh, or studying world religions. Um, in addition to these, there are memoirs, journals, travel literature, and other rare items that can spark conversations on particular events or larger topics, such as construction of empire, printing, Christian missions, first encounters, uh, modernity. Um, and then we have blocks and story maps. Uh, these put the spotlight on collection items, uh, but also provide narratives that students can critique or compare with readings in class. And then we have newspapers. Um, I think these are good primary source materials for studying how events and issues are portrayed in the press. And finally, we have web archives, uh, collections of ephemeral material found online, curated mainly by reference staff and our colleagues in our overseas offices. So um, having listed these groupings of resources, uh, let me now turn to highlighting some examples for each category. Uh, we'll start with some maps. Um, so what you see here are Ming Dynasty era maps. 
uh, featured in the slide, and these can be found in the Chinese collection and might be a way for students to get at um, Chinese perceptions of China and its relationship to the larger world. Um, on the left, you can see, and I do uh, pardon my pronunciation, but uh, you see the Kun Yu Wang Guo Quan Tu, or the Great Universal Geographic Map, um, created by Matteo Ricci in 1602, together, of course, with Chinese scholars. It shows an oval shaped uh, world map covers five continents and four oceans. And you can see Europe, Africa, South and North America, Asia, and Antarctica. And it's the first map, I believe, in Chinese to show the Americas. Then on the right, you can see another map, the uh, Guangyi Tu, so, or the Enlarged Universal Terrestrial Atlas of China. And it covers Yellow River, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and administrative divisions of China in the Ming Dynasty. Um, it also shows a number of soldiers and horses stationed in border towns and ethnic groups in the border area. So you could look at maybe terms used to describe different ethnic groups as well. Uh, and I've just selected two of those um, um, sections really of the map. Uh, there are a lot more. Um, besides that, in the middle, you can see another map, the Tian Di Tu or the Atlas of uh, Heaven and Earth. And what's portrayed here is a section of that shows Java, the Philippines, and Sumatra. Um, so to see what maps are available online, you can check out the link that I've included in the slide. And uh, um, there'll be links shared later after the uh, presentation. So uh, you don't have to worry about taking them down. Um, in addition to maps, the library also has an extensive collection of prints and photographs. And these are found at the prints and photographs reading room. And to search this content, you can go to the uh, PNP online catalog. I think about 95% of the material there has been cataloged. Uh, and a lot of it is available online, though not all of it because of copyright restrictions. Um, an example of an item found at PNP is a photograph taken in 1860, it's in the center of the picture there, during the first Japanese diplomatic visit to the United States. Uh, the photograph taken in the Washington Navy Yard could be used to spark a uh, conversation maybe on Japan's engagement of the world in 19th century. And the accompanying resources that you might pair with the photo could be perhaps a Library of Congress blog post on the first Japanese visit to DC and another blog post on black ship scrolls, which is a genre of Japanese paintings that captured historic meeting of Americans and Japanese when uh, the US Commodore Matthew Perry, and I quote from the blog, barged into Edo Bay with four American steamships, guns at the ready to negotiate a treaty with a Japanese government that had been uh, isolated somewhat for two centuries. Um, you could also throw perhaps the Japanese painting of the USS Susquehanna, which was uh, Perry's flagship into the mix. And um, maybe you could also link to, um, you know, a journal collection, the William Spiden Journals Collection. Uh, Spiden was a Persis clerk aboard the US steam frigate Mississippi. And he created a two volume journal dating from 1852 to 1855, documenting that naval expedition to the China Seas and Japan. Um, so these are just some suggestions to suggest um, perhaps ways you could put material together. Um, I'll now move on to rare books and manuscripts. As mentioned, the Library of Congress has a rich collection of um, these, and it's particularly strong when it comes to examples of religious texts, which are useful for teaching um, world religions. And in this slide, you can see a section of the Gandhara scroll from the ancient kingdom of Gandhara, today's Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, this ancient kingdom of Gandhara is the source of the oldest Buddhist manuscripts in the world, as well as the oldest manuscripts from South Asia in existence. So um, acquired in 2003, the Gandhara scroll roughly dates between the first century BCE and the first century CE. And its language is Gandhari, a derivative of Sanskrit, and the script is called Kharoshti. Uh, scholars have informally called this scroll the Bahubuddha Sutra, or the Many Buddha Sutra, because it resembles a text similar in name in Sanskrit. 
Um, so I thought maybe students might be surprised to know that the world's oldest extant Buddhist manuscripts have been found in Gandhara um, on the border of modern day Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, not typically associated with Buddhism these days. Um, and a discussion board post perhaps could ask students to identify what they think people would generally find surprising about this item. Um, and there's also a, a lecture by Professor Richard uh, Solomon in 2018. It's available online and it talks about this scroll. So that could be something um, that, that might be of interest to students. Um, you know, it might challenge the idea about how Buddhism spread. Um, and it's clear now that Gandhara was a major Buddhist center some 2000 years ago and that Buddhism went from India to Gandhara, then Central Asia, then on to China, Korea, and Japan. Um, in this next slide, I'd like to highlight another rare book, the uh, Doctrina Cristiana, published in 1593. Um, it's often said to be the first book printed in the Philippines, and the only extent copy in the world can be found in the Lessing Rosenwald collection um, at the library. And it's been digitized and it's available online. Um, the Doctrina is a catechism in both Spanish and Tagalog. Um, in the Doctrina, we see one of the earliest examples of printed Tagalog in Romanized and Baybayin script. So Baybayin was a writing system based on an index script which was developed prior to contact with the Spanish and uh, speaks to these connections of societies and what's now the Philippines to larger Southeast Asian trends. And in this case, the adaptation of uh, Indic writing for local languages. Uh, it was most probably printed by a Chinese or Chinese mestizo printer in Manila under the auspices of Dominican clergy. And so you see that the doctrina embodies the meeting of cultures, worldviews, technologies, and languages. Um, this catechism um, was shaped not only by missionaries, uh, some of whom had experience interacting with indigenous populations in Mexico prior to arrival in Manila, and also had extensive dealings with Chinese, but, there, um, but also by local interpreters, teachers, and craftsmen. So in this sense, the doctrina was both local and global, and the work reminds us of these deep ties that bind the Philippines, China, and the Americas. Um, the Doctrina Cristiana is just one of many missionary works at the library uh, that speak to the histories of colonialism, translation, conversion, and resistance. And some of these texts have been digitized, such as the Arte y Reglas de la Lengua Tagala, the 1610 grammar of the Tagalog language, printed by Tomas Pinpin, who was one of the first known indigenous printers in the Philippines. And we also have Alexander de Rhodes' 1651 Catechismus, which was one of the first Romanized Vietnamese language works. Um, so, you know, these have all been digitized. Um, but of course, we have a lot more that have not been. So please feel free to reach out to us using the Ask a Librarian service. Uh, besides the items mentioned, a uh, rich repository of rare material can be found in the World Digital Library Collection. And um, this collection contains cultural heritage materials gathered during the World Digital Library Project, including thousands of items contributed by partner organizations worldwide, as well as content from Library of Congress collections. And all items include narrative descriptions submitted by contributing partners, and it's uh, enhanced by WDL researchers to contextualize the item and its cultural historical importance. Um, these uh, materials uh, include cultural treasures, historical documents such as books, manuscripts, maps, newspapers. We even have sound recordings, photographs, and films there. Um, so this is a really great uh, repository in my opinion. And these are just a couple of examples of things you might find in that WDL uh, collection. So there's a, on the right, there's a Journal of Magellan's uh, Voyage. Uh, this was attributed to Antonio Pigafetta from around 1525, and it details Magellan's voyage around the world um, between 1519 and 1522. Um, this is a French version, 
So, you know, if your students don't read French, perhaps a free online version, maybe on Project Gutenberg in English, you know, could be a way you could pair that with this uh, copy and the WDL copy uh, would be useful for illustrations, perhaps. Um, another item in the WDL is the uh, Historia General de las Cosas de Nueva España, or General History of Things of New Spain. And it's an encyclopedic work about the people and culture of central Mexico, compiled by Fray Bernardino de Sagún, a Franciscan missionary who arrived in Mexico in 1529. So that's about eight years after Hernán Cortés uh, had arrived. Um, and it's commonly called the Florentine Codex. And Sagún uh, used a, um, a method of gathering information, which was said to be a sort of precursor to modern anthropological field technique. So he gained the assistance of uh, elders in central Mexico, the Principales, and also Nahua students and former students at the College of Santa Cruz in uh, Tlatelolco, where Sagún spent a lot of his time. So the Principales answered questionnaires, um, about their culture and religion, and their responses recorded in their own pictorial form of writing. And then the Nawa students interpreted the images and expanded the answers, phonetically transcribing Nahuatl using Latin letters. And then Saogun reviewed the Nahuatl text and then added his own Spanish translation. So perhaps this text could be used in a discussion on early encounters and exchanges between Europeans and indigenous populations in Mesoamerica. Um, um, we also have blogs and story maps at the Library of Congress, um, and these, uh, I mentioned, spot, um, highlight uh, collection items and provide narratives that students can critique or compare with class readings, and these resources, I believe, are accessible to students who might only speak English, so um, an example here is the Incunabula, the Art and History of Printing in Western Europe. And it's a story map that explores the early years of printing in Western Europe by looking at books printed before 1501 in the library's holdings. And you could juxtapose perhaps this story map with uh, um, you know, two posts in the library's international collections blog, the Four Corners of the World blog, uh, that privilege a point of view of printing based on Asian collections at the library. Uh, so if you have students perhaps consider these different entry points on the history of printing around the world, uh, it could be a way of engaging, helping them engage with the development of a technology that has multiple connections across regions, and um, a story I think that might be particularly well suited to world history. Um, and we have other blogs, I've just highlighted a few. Uh, the Unmaking of an Island, which is a blog post on the eruption of Krakatoa, featuring maps from the library's geography and maps collection. Um, it might be useful for a global environmental history course, I think. And uh, we also have unique seafaring charts of the Marshall Islands, which is a post on Marshall Island stick charts used by Marshallese for navigation in the Pacific and might be used for maybe a, a unit or a discussion on navigation in the Pacific and exploration by Pacific Islanders. And uh, since I've mentioned uh, the Pacific, I think it's a, I should uh, also point to a selection of fieldwork materials and papers uh, by the noted anthropologist, uh, Margaret Mead. Um, so we have a collection of um, her works. And perhaps uh, one thing that could be used is to compare Margaret Mead's work with maybe Captain Cook's journal in terms of, you know, uh, perceptions about the Pacific. Um, um, we also have other story maps, uh, like threads and words. It's about textiles at the library. And, um, you know, it goes from Jefferson's inaugural speech, which was published on silk, to Senufo wall paintings from Cote d'Ivoire to Tibetan tankas and connects it with, um, you know, other pieces at the library, like a Shia Muslim battle tunic embroidered with text from the Quran. So it's just a way for students to think about different ways cultures have approached uh, text and textiles. And finally, uh, one of the um, story maps I like is one about maps, maps that changed our world. 
So uh, this story map explores the changes in world maps throughout the centuries and how as a result perceptions of the world have shifted. Um, I'll move on now to newspapers. Uh, Emily's already mentioned the Chronicling America, um, you know, um, a resource I won't say too much about that, uh, but I will mention that we do have um, a lot of South Asian and Southeast Asian um, newspapers on microfilm. And uh, some of these are available for interlibrary loans. So that's a way of maybe getting at stuff that's not digitized just yet. Um, and um, I think it's a potentially rich repository for studying um, how the press has portrayed things. Uh, moving on now to the final category of things I mentioned, web archives. So um, these are collections of ephemeral material found online, as I mentioned, and cover a wide range of topics. And I've just picked a few here uh, that have a global scope. We have an LGBTQ plus studies web archive that traces uh, scholarship and culture and the history of uh, the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and then we also have the September 11th, uh, 2001 web archive, which preserves the web expressions of individuals, groups, the press and institutions in the US and around the world. Um, and we have the coronavirus, very recent, of course, um, and the Cultures Web Archive, which documents the creation and sharing of emergent cultural traditions on the web. And that's something that the American Folklife Center has been working with. And just two more web archives here. We have the Indian Political and Social Issues Web Archive. This is more regional in scope, but also has some global connections because it traces uh, political and social issues in India, South Asia, and diasporic communities. And something that's more national in scope would be the Malaysian Elections Web Archive. And you can see our different web archives at the uh, link provided. Um, there are quite a few of them. So in conclusion, I hope this overview of resources has given you some idea about the uh, scope of material uh, available for use for teaching and learning world history. I, I focus a lot on things that you can get to remotely, uh, but of course we have a whole lot more stuff that's available on site. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or to other reference staff. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to use our Ask a Librarian service, which is ask.loc.gov, and librarians normally reply within one, two, three business days. So a pretty quick turnaround. All right, thanks. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much, Joshua. I, I, uh, Billy asked me just to continue, so hopefully it's not too rude if I, I just jump in here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Hopefully that will uh, work and then uh, play. Everyone uh, see that as well? Thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Billy and uh, Ornell for, for inviting me to talk. Um, and uh, I, I definitely uh, learn a lot <laughs> in listening to uh, uh, Joshua and Emily's presentations. It's, it's always great to see um, how much rich material is out there. Uh, so just to introduce myself uh, briefly, I, I am, uh, in, uh, historian at the University of Albany, SUNY. Um, I have been uh, teaching here since uh, 2012. Uh, I teach courses on uh, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, uh, global environment, uh, pandemics, and world history recently. And um, I uh, received my training at uh, graduate training at the University of Wisconsin, which I think you'll see uh, sort of influences some of my approaches uh, to these questions. Um, I also have a, a background uh, Zoom. Uh, hopefully, it's appropriate for world history. Uh, I thought that was the, the one that I could uh, best choose. Uh, but you're probably seeing my PowerPoint in any case. Um, so uh, when uh, when Billy uh, invited me to uh, talk about materials I use to teach world history, uh, I wondered what to do because, as you have seen uh, from the previous presentations, there's so much out there, right? And um, kind of what material you choose as a teacher really depends on your 
uh, your students, your resources, um, you know, your needs, your goals for your class. And I know I, I just saw a few of um, the people attending this uh, talk and uh, I know there, there are some very experienced world history teachers here. So I, I, I hope in the Q&A and, and when, after this discussion uh, to, to also uh, learn from you. I, this is just a, a kind of, I'm just gonna give you my, uh, my take on teaching world history as a, as a way to open up uh, the discussion. So um, I decided to focus on uh, just a couple of courses that I've taught and sort of use this opportunity to think through um, the way that I, the ways that I use uh, electronic and print material uh, to engage students. So the first course that I wanna talk about is this um, 100 level, introductory world history course. Uh, it's, we call it now the past is present, the world since 1900. A um, uh, number of colleagues, three or four colleagues and I at UAlbany uh, take turns teaching this. So um, we all have a kind of slightly um, uh, different approach to it, depending on our own interest and our own expertise. Um, and this fall for the first time, I'm teaching this course as a, a blended or a a uh, hybrid course. And uh, so uh, for the purposes of 158, this means that I've replaced the, the two, um, two hours of in-person contact with uh, two kind of additional hour or two hours online uh, of online material. Um, and so we uh, keep one hour of uh, in-person contact, which is devoted to uh, discussion with either the TAs or myself. Um, so students uh, engage with online material through the learning management system we use here, which is Blackboard, uh, soon to be uh, Brightspace uh, next semester, next year. And there's a desire to learn, I think, is another name. Uh, this is a screenshot of the landing page where students uh, first arrive when they open uh, the Blackboard for the course. And usually at a minimum, I post a weekly announcement um, summarizing, you know, what's new and what's due for that week. So um, you can see the, the kind of the schedule for the current week here. Now, students have uh, three assignments due every week. Uh, one is a short online quiz with 10 multiple or two, two false questions based on the lectures and other viewing material. Uh, two, they have a short writing assignment based on the readings. And three, there's a worksheet um, based on the discussion readings. So here I'm just kind of giving you an overview of how I organize the course so you can kind of get what I'm doing. Um, under the course material tabs, then I've created five folders for five units during the semester. Uh, each folder has a summary of the material for the unit uh, along with the subfolders, uh, read, listen, watch, do. I, I try to keep things simple, although uh, students still uh, get lost. <laughs> and, and so it takes uh, some, some emailing or some in-person discussion to, to kind of um, clear things up. Uh, but this is fine. I mean, we're, uh, after a couple of weeks, uh, people get used to this. This is how, what I use week after week. Um, so these three folders divide up the reading and audio visual materials, uh, as well as the assignments. Uh, they include the links to the tool providers I use for the class. Uh, so the two main ways that I, uh, the two main tool providers I use are uh, Perusal, which if you um, know of it, it's basically a way to use digitized um, material and allow students uh, to comment on it. What I like about it is it's very interactive. So students are able to interact with each other. It kind of gives uh, some sense of the class, their classmates views and perspectives on things. Um, and from a teacher's perspective, What's great is that uh, perusal automatically grades uh, their comments. So there's a there's a logarithm, right, or a, a algorithm um, that gives um, you know a, a score. I, I set it so it's pretty easy for them to get full credit, and I also go in and make comments and sometimes uh, seed comments as needed. Um, but uh, anyways, that, that's uh, one uh, tool I use. The other tool provider I'm using now is uh, Panopto, which is um, now UAlbany's um, video software. So you can uh, basically upload videos and have it uh, on the learning management system. Uh, what's nice, uh, we just 
started using Panopto in the middle of the semester, but what's nice and I'm looking forward to uh, in the future is using the comment uh, function on the videos. So students can then uh, comment on each other or comment on the videos, comment on lectures, uh, engage with each other that way. So it's just, again, a way to kind of use some of the material that you've uh, imported uh, in, in ways. Um, so the online material, again, that I, I used for my course goes into slides for mini lectures, as well as the videos, podcast, uh, reading materials. Um, I've sought to use as many open education resources uh, as possible. The nice things about what Emily and Joshua are introducing is that they're all free, right? Um, we don't actually have a textbook in the course. Uh, we just, um, I replaced the textbook basically by uh, lectures, although the students do have to uh, buy a couple of um, books for discussion or at least get a couple of books for discussion. Uh, and then, um, one thing that has been kind of neat about this course and having colleagues who teach it is that uh, we actually got together a couple of years ago and recorded uh, five or six podcasts uh, based on it, just the three or four of us sitting around in a room talking about uh, different uh, themes in world history. We're kind of organized around dates. Um, and so that gives the students a chance to kind of get a personal perspective of, of us as teachers and also uh, varied voices on uh, topics, not just my voice or uh, not just the text voice. So it helps them, I think, engage. So I want to uh, just walk you quickly through uh, one week's material uh, that I use to discuss uh, the Great Depression and fascism, which is kind of a, a standard uh, topic in uh, world history. And so first, what I do is I, I record uh, two short lectures on these topics. Um, these are, you know, lectures that provide definitions and other baseline facts. Uh, not surprisingly, I talk about Nazi Germany. Um, I articulate the links to material uh, from earlier during World War I that we've discussed in the course and later during World War II, try to help the students make those connections. And this, these kind of mini lectures replace the standard um, textbook. Now, in addition, I assign a 2017 talk by Tim Snyder about his book uh, called The Black Earth, Holocaust as History and Warning, um, which is available online. And, you know, you can just kind of, I mean, what the neat thing about uh, uh, having uh, sort of post COVID or online even before COVID uh, world is that most authors give book talks. And so if you don't, if you can't assign the book uh, for a 100 level class, you can usually find a book talk um, in which uh, some of the major points are discussed. And this is uh, actually turned out to be a pretty good way to engage the students with a book, even if they were not going to read, sit down and read uh, 300 pages, or I'm not going to space that out during a semester. Um, so, uh, you know, and if you haven't read uh, Black Earth, it's basically Snyder makes an argument that um, e ecology and in particular ecological thinking uh, by Hitler uh, is one of the driving factors for the Holocaust. And it's, he's attempting to sort of understand um, what's going on with, with the Holocaust. Uh, now, of course, students were certainly slightly confused by the talk, some of them. And so we, in discussion, had to kind of um, uh, fill in some gaps or, or things like that. But it, it was actually, again, pretty efficient. Uh, way of getting to his argument. Then along with this recorded talk, I assigned a chapter from um, McNeil and Engelke's book, The Great Acceleration, uh, which is an uh, environmental history of the world basically since 1945. Um, and that chapter sort of uh, takes, uh, a, gives a broad overview to what Snyder is discussed in particular with the Holocaust. So students um, have a chance to read about issues of population, uh, energy and, and, and those concerns in the world. Um, they've also read the introduction already to uh, McNeil and, and Gelke's book. So they have an idea of what the Anthropocene is. And uh, this is something that I try to introduce uh, throughout environmental history uh, throughout uh, the course. And the, the students do end up reading all of the great acceleration. So that's sort of the textbook, unofficial textbook of the course, but it's free and it's through the university library. So again, um, not, a, not an issue for students. Uh, finally, the students read a primary source uh, 
from uh, Hitler's, uh, well, a, a speech from Hitler from 1922, uh, in which his uh, virulent anti-Semitism is on display. Uh, and so this primary source, uh, again, helps remind the students uh, that the Holocaust happened, uh, at least this is, you know, again, my argument in the course, not just because of ecological thinking, but also anti-Semitism. So you have to take the sort of two of them, these two different perspectives and kind of think of them together. And I asked the students to do a reflection on, on uh, this issue. And uh, that was the way to sort of tie the material uh, together. Now, um, I'm gonna introduce uh, briefly uh, one of the things that I do for uh, discussion section. So um, in the discussion section, I have three main purposes. Uh, the first and probably the most important is just to have the students in person in the same room as each other. So they get to know each other. Uh, they get to know either the TA or myself. Um, the second though, is to obviously go over the lecture material and try to sort of tie it in uh, to what is going on in the discussion. And the third, uh, what I'm uh, showing here are, are the three books I assigned for discussion in which students read about individual lives and then um, try to place them within uh, world history. And so with these individual uh, books, two of them are graphic, uh, well, a graphic history or a graphic autobiography. Um, the students, again, get the sense of the messiness of, of real lives, and I encourage them to think about their own agency and their own, their own lives. Um, so now, just to kind of give you a brief example from a book we're reading, the George Takai's um, graphic biography, they call this uh, Enemy. Uh, I um, assign each week a worksheet for the students to do. And in this particular week, uh, the students were taking uh, online material that I had found about uh, Camp Roar, which is where uh, uh, George Takai was uh, first sent, relocated with his family, and, and comparing it to uh, the graphic uh, biography. Uh, there's also a history or a sort of brief summary of the, the Camp Roar experience uh, by Gary Okahiro that I, I have them read. It's just like a page or two. Uh, again, to kind of basically uh, have the students play off of, of what Takai is talking about. Um, and so here uh, are the, the images that uh, the students uh, took. I, I um, gathered four images. Uh, this is from ABC Clio's The Asian American Experience. Uh, and I had the um, students actually, that, so these, these images are useful because uh, they have captions on them. And so there's sort of some detailed information that the students can, can use. I actually had the students rewrite the captions because I thought the captions were kind of boring and sort of, uh, you know, very, very straightforward, but not capturing some of the kind of um, uh, uh, historical significance of some of these photos or not, not being very, and their, their purpose was not necessarily to be analytical, but I want this, I encourage the students to rewrite in a more kind of critical vein uh, what was being described here. So, um, and again, uh, I got these uh, from ABC Clio, but even if you don't have access to this website, you can find uh, um, these sorts of images online. So I, you know, Arkansas State University, for example, has a whole uh, uh, website, a whole uh, basically archive of primary sources uh, dedicated to Camp Roar, which is where, which was in Arkansas. Um, and, and there's a, you know, there's, we had a, a long discussion in class about um, the, the sort of ways in which uh, photography lies, right? I mean, you know, the, again, the, the, the angles you choose, the, the sort of the set situations you have, um, and Sakai's graphic novel very nicely brings out kind of a re reality of the lived experience that um, these photographs, if you're looking at them, they seem kind of anodyne, uh, might not bring out. So the students was, was, again, a good way for students to engage with that. Um, then I, I tied that, uh, again, with more primary material um, back into lecture uh, when I was talking about the origins of the Cold War in Asia. And uh, there was, uh, I found uh, some material from former Japanese American internees who had then uh, joined the US military and fought in the Korean War. Um, this is a, um, you know, here on the, the slide, a, uh, 
journal from one of those uh, soldiers, George Naohara. Um, and I, uh, I found this uh, referring uh, to what uh, Emily was talking about through the digital, uh, was it the Digital Project Library of America, right? The DPLA. Um, and so I, I can't also emphasize enough, like I would have never found uh, Cal State University, uh, even though I grew up near Dominguez Hills, uh, fairly near there, I, I wouldn't have searched for their archives specifically. So having the aggregator um, was really, really uh, made that sort of feasible for me to find this. Um, and, and then in fact, there's a sort of rich archive um, at, at this particular Cal State related to um, this topic. But the, the question again is how to, how to find that when you have to pull together a course very quickly, right? Um, uh, and then um, again, so just to give an example for another week, I'm always looking for intersections between uh, lectures and reading materials, um, especially if they involve environmental history. Uh, so um, during a week on uh, mass consumer culture in the US and the USSR, uh, one of the graduate students at UAlbany, uh, Casey Holler, actually put together a lecture um, on bananas and mass consumerism and uh, sort of Latin America, US relations and 20th century environmental history. Um, she drew a lot from, uh, of course, John Saluri's work, Banana Cultures, but she added on her, her own research and um, found a you know, pretty amazing video, Why the Kremlin Hates Bananas, right? It's sort of UF, uh, United Fruit Company uh, propaganda, um, but really fascinating, right? 15, 15 minute video on YouTube. Um, again, original, you know, primary source material. Um, and it was something that helped the students connect then to uh, Rigoberta Menchu's uh, biography, which is about, uh, of course, Guatemala. And uh, she doesn't specifically mention uh, bananas or banana plantations, but she does talk about plantations, about agronomic institutes, about uh, agricultural change. And so, and, and the thread of the Cold War history about communism. So it's a, it was a really rich um, sort of uh, vein that the, that the graduate student uh, found. Um, so I think I'm, I'm uh, going to be, uh, again, it should uh, finish up here pretty quickly. So I'll go through uh, just a, a couple of other resources that I found useful. Um, not surprisingly, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has, uh, enrolled me in sorry, teaching about pandemics as well. Uh, um, its agency is, is sort of used, uh, used me to, to teach, it, teach <laughs> students about it, I guess. Um, and uh, so I revamped a course that I've been teaching about Asian health and, and sort of medicine into a pandemics in, in world history uh, course, which I taught in fall 2021. Um, one uh, unit we, we talk about is Ebola in West Africa. Um, I would recommend, these are not online sources necessarily, but um, Paul Farmer and Greg Mittman have a couple of books uh, that have uh, been very uh, useful uh, to talk about this topic. Uh, they also, uh, of course, Paul Farmer recently uh, passed away, but um, they have, before he passed away, they had an interview uh, uh, discussion together um, that you can find online, which again, uh, next time uh, I assign these, I'll, I'll have the students perhaps watch that. Um, other things uh, uh, online uh, are, uh, you know, Greg Mittman was part of a project uh, to direct a, a video in the shadow of Ebola, very short, uh, but good to show in class and then have the students sort of um, discuss uh, that material. A even bigger um, repository of primary sources that I found useful for teaching about pandemics is this um, 1918, about the 1918, 1919 uh, pandemics in uh, the US are this um, influenza archives uh, that the University of Michigan folks uh, uh, put up and um, they uh, sort of, uh, Howard Markell, uh, Ali uh, Minna Stern, um, also uh, published a series of, uh, or uh, journal articles coming out of this uh, primary research. Uh, what I had asked the students to do was to uh, so this is an archive of uh, basically 50 cities in the U.S. and newspapers related to uh, the pandemic uh, in these 50 cities. And I asked students to choose a city and write about the experience of the pandemic uh, based on the newspaper articles from that city. It worked out pretty well. 
another thing that um, we can find online now, of course, because of COVID, tons of podcasts, tons of interviews, um, just really rich material, again, to, to sort of offer to the students. Um, let's see. And so, yeah, other courses. Um, I, I'll just make a quick plug. Uh, if you're ever interested in teaching a spatial history of East Asia and Southeast Asia, um, I was uh, involved with a project called uh, Bodies and Structures. Uh, and it's a uh, sort of it's online scalar. It's research uh, driven, but it's meant for uh, student consumption. And it's meant to kind of uh, engage students in thinking about spatiality and how we uh, structure narratives and how we might sort of reimagine narratives and go beyond thinking of just a cartographic view of the world. So um, if you're ever interested, check that out. And then I, I think um, Lily can send out these links, uh, just a couple of things I found useful on, of course, wars always have lots of uh, primary source material. Um, environmental history uh, has a lot of great stuff. And blogs, of course, are, are super useful. Um, and then uh, some of the tools that have already been mentioned. And a big shout out to librarians, uh, as you can see, and, and archivists, they're awesome and uh, do great stuff with, with this material. So. Um, that's uh, that's it for me. All right, thank you so much, Mitch. I really, really appreciate it uh, as always. Um, I just want to zoom back out here to take sort of the the thousand foot view of this workshop. I, again, it's thinking historically and teaching globally. Uh, as folks may have noticed, uh, we should we should spell this out. We all have a through line between the people that I asked to speak, and that's around Southeast Asian studies. All of us are somehow connected in that fashion. Um, but that being said, uh, myself, prior to working at the library, I actually also taught world history, which is why when I heard about the changes in the Sunni curriculum, particularly emphasizing diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice, having just come from the state of Louisiana UL system, where I had advocated for the creation of a diversity, equity, inclusion uh, certificate program, and also an international studies minor program as part of undergraduate curriculum development, my ears perked up. Um, so I particularly have appreciated hearing from especially community college faculty from across the state um, and also from teaching college faculty from across the state, thinking about how these curricular changes might impact the humanities and social sciences more broadly. Um, we emphasize today across Emily, Josh's, and Mitch's uh, presentations, just as simple resources that folks might not already be available, um, might not already be aware of in terms of their availability. Um, we didn't strongly emphasize necessarily uh, the pedagogical aspects of these resources, in part because we sort of imagined that um, a lot of the faculty, the, their classrooms are so different and things like that, um, that you will know your own pedagogical approaches better than we will. Um, that being said, I really appreciated Josh's and also Mitch's classroom suggestions. I, I thought those were really excellent. Uh, we do have a question from uh, Bill Trumbright, um, and, and, and Bill, I hope I get your question right. So he asks, could someone comment on uh, pros and cons, and you can think creatively here, of relating United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in the teaching of certain aspects of world history? Um, and, and he provides the examples such as the acceleration of the end of colonialism in Southeast Asia post-1945. Um, I think that you could make a, a comparable example in Northeast Africa, for example, um, or also in, in Western Africa as well. Um, but yeah, would anybody like to answer that question? Let's close. Mitch, I saw you nodding along, so perhaps I'll call. Well, I, I, don't, I mean, I also, again, want to turn it over to, uh, we've got a distinguished uh, group of, of, um, of, of teachers here. Um, and I mean, 
Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I just, again, I don't know if, you, if you're thinking about talking about specific resources or the importance of thinking about, say, decolonization along with environmental history and, and sort of how to do that through primary sources. Um, because I, I think those are, those are key, those are two big units, for example, in my, in my world history class. My point would be is that when we look at, when you're looking at post 45, what's happening in Southeast Asia, for example, around the globe is also intertwined with the Cold War. So that if you look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights as a document, it's very much talking about all peoples. When you look at Western perspectives of the Cold War, many of the areas of the world were effectively seen as so-called third world. In other words, the main conflict was with the US and the then Soviet Union, and then everything else was just sort of kind of coming along in the wake, so to speak. So this is why I'm this is why I was asking the question because it seems to me that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are in a sense an outgrowth of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. You're taking the broad statement of the UN Declaration and now you're saying, okay, this is what it means tangibly. So that's why that's why I was bringing the question in, is that, a, I mean, in doing that, can one, I guess, could it be done? But number two, what are the consequences of trying to do that, say, on a 100 level class vis-a-vis -vis, you're talking about a 300, 400 level class? In other words, is that the type of approach that is more suited for the upper division rather than the 100, 200 level? So that's part of what motivates me to ask the question, because you are talking about the intertwining of various nations around the globe. I, I'm just pointing out that period here. There are other periods that could be that could probably be applied to. Yeah. I, sorry. Can I? That's that's great comments, Bill. Can I ask you? Do you do you teach um, this issue in, in a 200 level class or a 300 level, or how do you how do you address? We are, I'm teaching at community college, so it's 100, 200 level. Okay. And basically, we're talking. That what I'm teaching is a survey, mm -hmm. 100 level. So this is. So this is one of the questions here pedagogically. Yeah. Can, is this, might this be too much conceptually at the hundred level or is it somewhere, could it be a type of entree and saying, okay, let's take a more global look and a less Eurocentric, West centric look. Yeah. I, even, I think, though, even though when you're talking about the UN declaration, yeah. There's very much a West centric approach in the Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah. 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 No, I, I think that's a great, great point. I, I mean, I, I, the way I approach it at the 100 level is just to talk about, um, again, decolonization with an emphasis on Southeast Asia, um, Africa, South Asia. Right, and uh, I actually don't talk about the UN that much. Uh, it's surprisingly not not a big part of my my uh, 100 level class. Um, but then you know emphasize environmental issues later, and and then definitely in in the last later weeks of the course talk about um, climate change, uh, what you might say is uh, perhaps development goals, UNDP goals. Um, millennial goals, those kinds of things. And, and sometimes the students, I think at the 100 level, just kind of have to absorb it <laughs> and make the connections themselves, you know, and, and uh, sort of, they might not get everything and they might forget a lot, but it also, my, my guess is that your students, if you do that at, at the 100 level, anywhere, community college, college, university, they're going to come back to that at the three or 400 level. And, and it, you know, light's going to click, and they're going to say, "Oh, okay, I get it." Right? That's that's why we learned about decolonization and environment, and and now we can make the connections. Right? I mean, that that's my that's my sense of the thing. Maybe I'm too optimistic, but <laughs> no, I think that that's a that's a great perspective. Um, so we have another question here. Um, from Evan Sullivan, um, and this is actually, it, it merges 
nice with uh, Jan Marvin Goh's question here. Um, so Evan asks, uh, do folks, uh, and I, it does not just have to be speakers that answer this question. Anybody could answer this question here. Um, do folks assign any historical films or documentaries um, that are historical in nature that work particularly well with diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice or world history and global awareness? Um, so do you integrate environmental historical approaches and other thematic approaches to broader topics? So then also, so Jan Marvin Goh's question is, um, can you talk about certain film archives? And, and this may be sort of the librarian end of things, film archives that work particularly well with uh, certain global perspectives, right? So it could be Latin American perspective, it could be global perspective, um, could be Southeast Asian perspective. I'm paraphrasing on these questions. Um, but yeah, yeah, so so perhaps tackle the first one uh, about pedagogy first. And if there are folks who have used certain films, you know, I, in their classrooms, um, who, who are not necessarily panelists, but just want to chime in, you know, you can put your hand up or something like that, and I can unmute you. And I wanted to give people time to, to chime in, but uh, seeing nobody chiming in at the moment, um, I've got a couple of suggestions, uh, but Mitch, why don't we hear from, from you first? And then we'll kick it to uh, Emily and Josh with their suggestions, and then I'll follow up at the end. Yeah, yeah, I see Emily and Josh just writing in the chat box. <laughs> 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 Taking it. Well, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's I, I just, Thinking, um, uh, 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 you know, about films that I've used in the past. I mean, just one has been. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. I haven't taught the class for a couple of years, but in Southeast Asia, there's a there's a Dow's Dow's Decker, uh, you know, Mutatuli uh, sort of um, create creative um, documentary about his life. Obviously, not documentary in the sense that he was dead, but you know, he's he's this 19th century. Uh, activist, Dutch activist who uh, goes on to sort of expose the exploitation in the coffee industry in in the Dutch East Indies, right? One of the most famous and sort of that that's kind of a interesting, I think, entree into talking about um, activism and kind of the, the importance of um, sort of calling out, you know, uh, uh, exploitation, those kinds of things. I found so there, there, there's some really good documentaries, um, some kind of cool stuff that I you know, related to like the United Fruit Company's video in Latin America. I've used rubber, so I think it's uh, Michelin, but what's the uh, the American company? It's not Bridgestone. Um, uh, Goodyear uh, has a has a uh, some uh, rubber plantation videos from uh, from the Southeast Asia that are you know from the 1920s that are, are again fascinating documents that uh, I found so. Um, you know, companies often use places you wouldn't necessarily think would be recording um, these kinds of videos often do put them together uh, quite, quite early, in, at least in the 20th century, uh, not, not back in the time Joshua is talking about, but that's worked for me, so. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so Josh, you wanna take it away? Uh, well, I've... I've shared a couple of links there. They're more general, uh, but they're Library of Congress links to the Moving Image Research Center. And then another link is on archival footage that's in the public domain as well. So uh, perhaps you know, looking through those might uh, yield something of use. Um, one that I've, I, I've seen in a course I TA a while ago was, um, I think it's Mother Dao, the turtle-like. Um, so it's this, um, I think, compilation of clips, uh, documentaries, propaganda films uh, shot by Dutch cameramen from 1912, I think, to about the 1930s. And it contrasts the lives of the Dutch uh, colonialists and indigenous people. And it was supposed to be this 
whole thing about uh, showing how great colonialism was, but actually when you look at it, you see the disparities that uh, in injustice and that exploitation as well. So uh, um, I think that might be a film from Southeast Asia that could be um, relevant or used. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks very much for the recommendations, Josh. And Emily, how about you? Sure, I've just been doing some frantic searching on the back end here. Um, so I should have mentioned this in my introduction. I'm not a Southeast Asianist. I'm not a historian. I'm not a professor. I'm a, my expertise is in archives and digital archives. Um, so I can really help with the searching. I cannot help with the pedagogy. Um, but I've put a few links in the chat. So first, the Southeast Asia Digital Library, as I mentioned, we have a number of video resources, including oral histories, but also television shows um, and some really interesting videos on um, the art of making and performing with uh, puppets, marionettes in Burma. Um, we're doing a current digitization project right now with the Thai Film Archive. So this question comes just a few months too soon, but if you check Southeast Asia Digital Library in the future, we're gonna have about 40 films digitized from reels uh, in Thailand, which is very exciting. Um, but I also just put some links to some of those research guides that I talked about. I found a few that had very specific sections dedicated to visual and AV resources. So um, hopefully those can be jumping off points to find more resources uh, that could fit in with the classes and lessons that you're trying to teach. All right. Thanks, Emily. Um, and I am mindful of the time here, so I do want to wrap up just slightly a little bit before 3.30. So if anybody has any final questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, because uh, Mitch has so graciously agreed to join us, but uh, has family matters to attend to. It's the end of the school day. Um, has to run and provide transportation, I take it. Um, so my recommendation, and I'm going to try and hit it out of the park with this one in terms of intersections is a documentary called A Village Called Versailles. And it is about a Vietnamese American community in New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. So you have all these intersections of diasporic experience in the United States, um, connecting to the historical memory of the Vietnam War and the past and movement of the community to the United States. The community itself is predominantly Catholic and so was a religious minority in Vietnam as well. Um, and in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, there's a, a cleanup and there is a, a quite a lot of waste and the waste is set to be dumped near their community. And so what they do in response, uh, and I'm sort of giving the short version of the story is they organize a social movement, a protest movement, and they successfully protest um, in order to ensure that the rights of their community to not be polluted are protected. Um, so it does actually end on a very positive note as well. Um, so it's great for students in, in that um, sense. And uh, in terms of using that in classroom, it, it, with, with film, you can isolate clips, of course. Um, you can find this on YouTube. Um, you can also, I put the website in the chat. You could also um, seek out to purchase a copy. But um, generally speaking, as a sort of overview here, all of the resources that we shared today were prompted by requests from individual faculty in the SUNY system. Um, and I'm extremely grateful to the faculty in the SUNY system who sent those requests to me or asked uh, for those resources, but also to my friends and colleagues, um, Emily Singer and Joshua Quay at the Library of Congress and also Mitch Asso at SUNY Albany uh, for joining us today and also for all their work providing resources for teaching as well. So seeing no further questions, um, Thanks very much to our speakers. And this has been a lovely experience. I will hang out here for a few more minutes. Um, so if anybody has any direct questions for me, uh, I will be here.
for, for several more minutes. Um, but I do want to allow Mitch to, to hop off so that he can go. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Phil. And thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, take care. Take care. Okay, take care. Um, so we have uh, a question from Teddy Ko. Uh, what about films made by the United States Information Service um, and International Communications Agency? I have no idea about that. So, uh, Josh, you nodded. <laughs> uh, well, yes, uh, we do have print documents, um, you know, at the Library of Congress. These could be posters, etc. cetera. Um, and it's, uh, I, I believe we might have some of that as well at our, uh, you know, moving images uh, reading room. I, I'm, I'm, I haven't looked for the film footage, uh, but it's conceivable that we do have that. Um, I do know we have print uh, material posters and the like. Uh, and I've seen a few for Laos, for uh, very few for Indonesia, but more so for Thailand. I think some from Cambodia as well. So I've, I've seen that in our rare uh, vault. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much. Um, as folks can see, the, the librarians are always crucial to the process of thinking about classroom materials because um, they have inside information that the rest of us don't necessarily have. Um, so uh, again, I'm mindful of everybody's time. So if, as folks want to hop off, please feel free to hop off. Um, and that includes our guests, Emily Singer and, and Josh Quinn. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, again, I'll hang out for a couple more minutes just to um, make sure everybody has their needs met, but please uh, feel free to enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Once again, thanks so much for coming, everyone. <laughs>